Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Catcher in the Rye, Holden as Teenage Rebel, an online professional development seminar sponsored by America in Class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Schramm. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Center, and I'll be moderating this evening's session. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about the Humanities Center for those of you who are new to uh, our seminars. The center is located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. That means we sponsor research uh, written by scholars in subjects like history, literature and language studies, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. We opened in 1978 and about, about 1,400 scholars have worked here and they've produced about 1,400 books based on research done here at the center. Now, we also offer a wide variety of programs for high school teachers of American history and literature. And you can find out what those programs and resources are by going to americaandclass.org. That will land you on this page. And from here, you can access all of the things we offer to American history and literature teachers. And talking about products, let me tell you <clears throat> about something new that we are doing. Uh, we are developing an online professional development course. The draft will be ready in February, and we'd like to have this evaluated by teachers all over the country. So if you'd like to volunteer to become uh, an evaluator for this new product the National Humanities Center is producing, please uh, send an email to ccoplick at nationalhumanitycenter.org. You probably dealt with Karen as you registered for this program. And uh, when the prototype is ready, we'll send you the URL, and we really would like to hear your opinions about this new product we are producing. Now, at the end of our seminar this evening, you can go to the Catcher in the Rye webpage, the page um, through which you accessed uh, the reading material and other information about this seminar. And there you will find a recording of the seminar and the PowerPoint presentation. And we invite you to go ahead and plunder that PowerPoint presentation and use it in your classes. You will also find an evaluation. And we ask you to complete that and send it back to us. And once we get that, we will send you a uh, documentation of participation that you can present to your local certifying authority to get whatever recertification credit your participation in the seminar warrants. Now, how do you participate? Well, uh, in our discussion this evening, in our seminar this evening, our scholar Grace Hale is going to be making comments and stopping from time to time to ask questions. Uh, when we do, we hope you'll respond, and you can respond to us by putting your cursor in that box that I've bracketed in green there. It'll be at the lower right hand of your screen. Type your message, hit that send button to the right. Your message will appear in the large chat box above. I'll be following the chat all evening and bringing your questions and your responses and comments into the conversation at appropriate times. And we really do urge you to, uh, to participate. Uh, don't wait until we ask a question. If you have <clears throat> an insight or a comment or a question of your own, please bring that into the webinar. If you see a good teaching opportunity, let us know that. Share it with us. Um, if you see a passage that is especially usable in a class, let us know how you'd present it. And if you see a potential project or assignment in the material, share it with us. As I said, these seminars really work well uh, when our participants uh, engage with us and we have a lot of feedback. Okay, so let us get underway. Our understanding this evening is The Catcher in the Rye foreshadows the age of social media. Its protagonist tells a story of the self in order to connect with others and find community. To bring us to that understanding and to lead us through this wonderful novel, we are very pleased to have with us tonight Grace Elizabeth Hale, who is the Commonwealth Professor of American Studies and Professor of History, Director of American Studies at the University of Virginia. Grace was a pro uh, fellow here at the National Humanities Center in 2002-03, where she worked on A Nation of Outsiders, How the White Middle Class Fell in Love with Rebellion and Post-War America. So let me turn the program over to Grace. Grace? Tell us about Catcher in the Rye. Thanks, Richard. I just want to start by saying it's really great to have a chance to talk with all of you teachers tonight. I always find it very inspiring and, 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 and really sometimes humbling to talk with, with uh, other teachers about uh, things that we're teaching. Um, and I thank you for that. Um, our key questions tonight uh, are, um, why do people want to see themselves as outsiders? And what are the effects of this desire on our history and culture? And those are some of the questions we're going to think about as we, as we talk a little bit about Catcher in the Rye. 
Uh, here at the beginning, I'm just going to speak a little bit, sort of setting some things up, and then as we move through the presentation tonight, uh, we'll be doing a lot more back and forth, a lot more chances for you to participate. Um, J.D. Salinger's 1951 novel, Catcher in the Rye, is really, I think, a terrific text for exploring these questions of what does it mean to be an outsider and how does our desire for that kind of position affect our society and culture. Um, and I think one of the things that's interesting about this text is the way it reflects the mid-20th century culture out of, out of which it emerges, and also the ways in which it has an effect on history, uh, becomes a bestseller, and then in turn affects uh, how people who read it see the world in, its, in the aftermath of that experience. Um, one of the things I think that's really important about it and could make, can make it actually difficult to teach depending on the, the group that you're working with there in your classroom is that it gets inside the head of a middle class, upper middle class even, white teenager. The kind of person who's supposed to be the beneficiary of all this post-World War II prosperity and shows the reader uh, this character's psychological alienation and estrangement. Uh, his feelings of unreality and lack of, of emotional connection uh, and his difficulty relating to society. Now I think depending on the students that you're teaching that can be uh, an, e an easier or more difficult entree, entree point. Um, whether those students can feel connected to Holden is something that we might discuss as we progress. Um, one of the things that I think makes this novel powerful, though, is it gives the reader a solution to the alienation that Holden feels, feels and that solution is self-expression. Uh, self-expression as a way to connect with others and to connect community, uh, to create community, excuse me, with other people who might feel alienated or feel like outsiders. And this, I think, is something all of our students, high school students, college students, do all the time living immersed in this world of, of, the, of the World Wide Web, the digital community. Self-expression is the way that we make community. Um, it's the way that we reach out to others across uh, those spaces. Um, and in, in this sense, I think Catcher is a kind of prehistory of social media. Uh, Holden is telling the history of himself as a way to try to get out of his alienation. Uh, uh, and, in, and in this particular time period, this act is really pretty radical. Uh, it's a, and it's an appealing idea to many young people in the 1950s uh, and afterward. Uh, today, I think it's going to be really familiar to our students. Um, it's the way we live today, making the self through expressing the self. This is really what social media is all about. Uh, the selfie, the tweet, Facebook, etc. So what I want to do is very briefly talk a little bit about the history out of which the novel is written and within which the novel circulates, and then move us into a close analysis of the novel in which I'm hoping that we can really get some good back and forth going. Uh, in that section, we will be considering uh, both the content, the plot, and also the formal and aesthetic qualities of Salinger's writing. Uh, and in this way, I'm using a, an American Studies type approach of text and context. Um, so if we could go to our first slide, let's see. So the general history, um, I think, you know, with your students, it's good to actually begin, this is where I would begin in a college class, setting out a few things about the time period. Uh, this period of, of great post-war prosperity doesn't encompass all Americans, but more Americans than ever before are, are sharing in that prosperity. Um, the emergence of what many scholars call mass culture, uh, commercialized popular culture. Uh, these forms of expression are not new, but they reach a kind of critical mass in the post-World War II period. Also, the intellectual and cultural history of this period. It's a, a very powerful turn inward uh, among many Americans, uh, a time of exploring emotions, feelings, beginning to think more about the interior self or the subjective self. In part, I think this is spurred by, by the prosperity, by the fact that people don't have to, they're done with the depression, the World War II is over and they have that luxury, but also inspired by Freud and the growing popularity of psychological thinking more generally. Uh, and also uh, in response to intellectuals who are writing in many kinds of uh, mass circulation magazines and newspapers about their particular fears 
of mass culture and how it is eroding individualism. And then finally, I think it's important to think about the literary history, the state of fiction at the time, uh, how Catcher uh, is shaped by the history of writing before it. Uh, you might talk a little bit about Salinger's biography, although I think that uh, that might be a little bit tough to discuss with high school students. I'll wait for some feedback from you on that. Um, and then I think the major sort of aesthetic issues to think about are how the novel transforms the classic coming of age narrative and adapts it for the post-World War II time period in the U.S. Um, and, and the ways in which this novel is um, part of the larger modernist trend in writing. It's part of modernism. Uh, it's, uh, alienation is both its subject and to some degree its form. The book uh, can be alienating and was alienating to especially older people who read it when it was first published. And then finally, I think the major aesthetic contribution, another major aesthetic contribution, is the distinctive voice that Salinger crafts for Holden. Turn now to the actual novel. Enough, enough of me uh, doing all the talking here. And really just think about this opening. Uh, so this, this opening is is... Uh, it's, it, it starts immediately. It jumps right in. Uh, it, it, it grabs you, or in the case of some of your students, perhaps it doesn't grab them, but I think it's important to think about what Salinger's trying to do here. If you really want to hear about it, the first thing you'll probably want to know is where I was born and what my lousy childhood was like and how my parents were occupied and all before they had me and all that David Copperfield kind of crap, but I don't feel like going into it if you want to know the truth. So I just want to start then by asking, what do we learn about Holden and, uh, and really what's going to be the rest of this novel from this opening sentence? Okay, <clears throat> I have a question on the table. What do we learn about Holden in the novel from the opening sentence? Focusing on opening sentences of novels is an excellent way to get into them. Careful writers build a whole lot into those, uh, those first few words. Like, call me Ishmael. All right. The reader might learn right away that Holden is alienated and depressed. Okay? Right there. Sets, sets many of the themes that, in the tone. That's, that's terrific. And I, and I think that writing about depression is something that's, you know, super uh, popular and common in our own time, but much, much more rare when this novel comes out. So uh, this uh, is a fairly radical opening move. Yeah. To make that clear. Grace, we also have a comment. He's definitely unhappy. And, and here's a really interesting one about how contemporary students take it. My students thought he was a brat and entitled. He's bitter. Holden is lonely, self-fulfilling. Uh, let me urge um, our participants to share the way your students view this novel now. I think that would be a really good, a good um, uh, thread to develop in this seminar. Uh, I know I read this many, many years ago. Uh, so let us know how your contemporary students uh, respond to it. But Grace, what do you say here? We've got, uh, I've never had a problem teaching this text in high school, but I've had difficulty with highly polarized responses. Hate it. He's an emo. Love it. I don't know. I don't know. I know him. Uh, he has low self-esteem, spawn of Western culture who is moody. How does this, I, Grace, I love. I love these reactions, and I, I think that um, this is, you know, I've read this novel many times, and I just reread it again, and for the first time I've read this novel is the parent of people about Holden's age, <laughs> and uh, that gave me just an entirely new relationship to the text, and also I have to say I forced it upon my, my own uh, teenagers, whose reaction was much like the person who said entitled, privileged, um, I didn't get hated. He's it's he's an emo in that exact uh, quote or spawn of Western culture who was moody. But that was really the, the the reaction of the teenagers in my own in my own household. So I'd love to know what what uh, folks do when they're teaching this novel to to open up this story. Okay, <clears throat> how do you open it up? How do you uh, get your students into it? Um, with students either love him or hate him. I know when um, when I read this back in the dark ages, uh, people really liked Holden. I mean, we, I went to college my first uh, freshman year in college. We had a guy who talked like Holden Caulfield, or at least tried to. Uh, we all <laughs> thought he was kind of strange, but uh, that's how powerful the novel was back uh, in the early 60s. 
Yeah, uh, I, I'm just a tiny bit younger than Richard, but I remember uh, really absolutely loving Holden when I first read this novel uh, in the 1980s. Uh, All right. So I, 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 anybody have a response to that? Hey, my, well, my students were very judgmental of Holden and very hard on him until the end of the novel. Interesting. The love it is easy to work with. The hate it works, too, because they want to see him crash and burn, so they'll read it <laughs> hoping he does. Uh, I uh, would forward the question, what else does the narrator expect you to you want to know about him? That's a good question. He, he is depressed. He is sad, but... Um, he really doesn't want to talk about his family. He's, he's alienated, yeah, but he seems to be particularly alienated from his family and his past. Uh, and he's going to tell you this story on his own terms. That's pretty clear. Yeah. What I love about this opening, too, just to add to what all, all, all the things that you guys are saying, is the way that he, um, he shows us what the storytelling frame is. Um, that, that he, Holden, is going to tell you this story. These are, this is his recollection. This is his, this is his memory. Uh, he's going to elaborate on that in the next few sentences and, and, and for a few par first opening paragraphs. But he's setting up a kind of storytelling frame. In, in a sense, he's almost making us into his therapists. Uh, we, uh, we have to listen to his story. Uh, and he's going to, in some ways, uh, let us inside of his head uh, into his interior space. But he's going to do it on his own terms, as some of you have suggested. Um, he's going to do it on his own terms, and he's he's going to, to do it expecting, or in some ways thinking you might not get it, uh, thinking that, that there's going to be some disconnection and some alienation in, the, in our relationship to him, just as he has to the world and to, to the people around him. Yeah, and Pat Marshall has a good comment here uh, along the same lines we've been when uh, discussing already. He is choosing what to reveal, though uh, that's important to discuss. Why does he make the choices he makes? Very good question. And one thing that just struck me now, he's very much in control. I mean, he, he's going to tell you his story, but he's also, I don't feel like it, and I'm not going to go down that road. And so he, he's, he's asserting control here right from the start. The language suggests he is baiting the reader. Ah, good, good insight. Saying he won't discuss certain things when we know that he will. We don't know it yet. He just wants us to pay attention. Very good. Very good. I, I think that's really terrific. And I have to say, again, was, I was so struck by that, how this was just a, a in, in the language of the 1950s, for sure, but it was such a teenage move. You know, such the kind of thing that a teenager would say uh, to uh, to someone. Uh, they want to tell their story. They want to let you in, and they don't. They want to. Mm -hmm. They want to do it, but they want to have control over it. Uh, they're they're not going to make it easy. Uh, the snarkiness is 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 going to be powerful, um, and I think that's really terrific. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe we can move to the next. Uh, yeah. So these were the framing questions that I started with. That we really. Um, uh, probably should have had at the very beginning of the of the of the setup here, so I'm going to skip those since we've already uh, put them on the table. Back to those again at the end of the presentation. So here's another uh, quote from fairly early in the novel, and uh, I think it'd be a good point for us to take up uh, for some more discussion. When all was, when, excuse me, when I was all set to go, when I had my bags and all, I stood for a while next to the stairs and took a last look down the goddamn corridor. I was sort of crying. I don't know why. I put my red hunting hat on and turned the peak around to the back the way I liked it, and then I yelled at the top of my goddamn voice, sleep tight, you morons. I'll bet I woke up every bastard on the whole floor. Then I got the hell out. I think there's much to discuss here, uh, the voice in particular, but in, uh, in addition to that, I think these discussion questions um, really could get us started. Uh, what is Holden leaving, and what is the significance of, of his act here in the life of an adolescent? Okay, <clears throat> two new questions on the table. Why, what is Holden leaving, and what is what significance would this act have in the life of an adolescent? Okay, he's leaving Pensy Prep, his boarding school, right? Yes. Uh, community in which he never really quite fit in. Yeah, but he's breaking with that major structuring institution mm. of uh, middle-class teenage life, the school. So that, right. 
He's leaving something bigger. Pensy is symbolic for society, certainly his society, the major institution in his society. That's true. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, he's really, yeah. he's really, uh, at least he's announcing to us and to his uh, fellow classmates that he's, he's going to be an outsider. Right. I think he feels empowered because he chose to leave before the prearranged day. Yeah, that's terrific. Again, him attempting to take control uh, over his story, uh, if not his actual life, right? We're getting the we are getting the story, but he's he's trying to take control over the story. Mm -hmm. The I don't know why puts me in mind of so it goes from Slaughterhouse Five. Nice literary connection there. Holden, like many teens, doesn't understand what he's feeling, what emotions comprise his being at the moment. Yet he takes action regardless. Good point. Yeah, uh, that, that's very that's very that's very wise. Um, <laughs> I I I think that you know the the challenge here, but it has such wonderful potential payoff. It seems to me is for teenagers to see uh, that a novel that's you know at this point more than sixty years old uh, really uh, has a lot of resonance with the way way that they are in the world today, uh, the way they they act and think. Uh, I think that's really pretty powerful. Um, and the comment about he doesn't understand what he's feeling, uh, but he's acting, uh, he's acting anyway. He knows he has to do something, so he's going to act. I think that's really terrific. I'm struck in this quote by how he's trying to act so grown up and, again, to be so sort of, somebody put it, baiting, off-putting, but also the childish gestures, uh, especially the, the, the red hunting hat, how he's putting it on in the particular way he likes. So you get that wonderful sort of image of a teenager who's trying so hard to be an adult and also still so much a child. That's another thing Holden foreshadows, wearing baseball caps backwards. <laughs> That's great. That's really great. Okay, well, shall we move ahead then? Yes. Okay. Um, so what kind of character is he um, and what is he looking for? And I, and I would toss these out there for students as a way just to begin to really get into the, into the you know, meat of the story. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. We have some comments coming through the chat here. But uh, So what is he looking for? We've, we've discussed his character quite a bit. Yeah. If we want to add to that, let's do. But what is he looking for here? That seems to me to be the, uh, the new question on the table. So any suggestions as to what he's looking for? Okay, let's see. We've got some things coming across. Um, I'm I'm not sure Holden knows what he's looking for at this point. I think he's he's looking for some connection. I mean, we see him trying to connect throughout the novel with all kinds of people, and he's looking. I would I would say he's looking for some sort of self definition. I'm struck by the uh, scenes in the search for significance. Okay, I'm struck by the scenes in the novel in which he he he, he dramatizes himself. You know, he's, he's trying to define himself as a hero, as a victim, and so on. But here we have, uh, I think he wants what most teens want to be understood. I agree that he doesn't know what he's looking for, though. Possibly he's looking for a sense of wholeness to fill his deceased brother's void. Ah, yes, yes, an important element in the novel. Grace, what do you make of those responses? I think those are terrific. I, 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 I have much more admiration than at other times when I've read this book for the comment that someone offered that he doesn't know what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. I think that that's pretty characteristic of the age. But I also think um, uh, some of the other points that you're making, um, one of the ways it seems to me to bring, uh, bring students into, uh, into this novel who might be pushing back against it, might think he's entitled and a brat and really hate the character, is really to emphasize from the start that loss of his brother. Uh, he doesn't talk about it very much in the beginning of the story, but we get hints of it. He talks about it a, it a bit, and it, it comes out over the course of the novel. But that uh, that alienation and that sense of loss, um, that seems to me that something that uh, transcends uh, his entitlement, um, his class privilege, uh, and uh, something that might actually make him a more sort of... Uh, make some students be able to see him in more and more positive light. Um, mm -hmm. But I think he's looking for something that's not phony, right? Yeah. He's gonna tell well, great, that. Grace, we have some other comments here that I think are really insightful. Kara writes, I always thought Holden was looking to the past 
he seems lost in the moment and cannot accept change. Harlan writes, carefree pass, someone to take care of him and listen to him. Um, then Carrie writes, cannot accept change is true, I often char uh, but I often characterize many adults that way, ironic. And he may also be looking for genuine tra traits in those around him. See, oh, he so often comments on phony, he sees in others, teenagers are often raw in their emotions. He may be looking for a place to call home. So there is that quest for authenticity, something that isn't phony. Uh, I think we have some really good comments there. Fantastic. Uh, again, I'm struck by the, the, the way that the adolescent is both a child and adult and how that comes uh -huh. through in your comments, your really terrific comments. I mean, that he's looking for a home, that he's looking for somebody to take care of him. And at the same time that he, uh, he, he's pushing against change, he's questioning the adults around him, and he's also trying to be an adult. So it, it seems to me that, 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 that you can sort of summarize many of the great points that you're making in terms of those ways in which he's trying so hard to be an adult, but he's also giving us real evidence that he's still a child. Right. Here's another 50s cultural illusion that I think is particularly apt. Holden reminds me of the Jim's James Dean character in Rebel Without a Cause. He's so disappointed with the adults to whom he is looking for truth. Uh, pretty fantastic. good comparison. Yeah. That's hadn't fantastic. occurred to me. Um, it's something that I, I uh, certainly have thought a lot about in my own research. It's a, it's a great comparison. Uh, the, many of the people who later write in, in memoirs or, or in their letters or comments uh, that, that have survived in the archives, so these are usually people that go on to, to do something important in the world, but we see a lot of people mentioning reading Catcher in the Rye in high school or college, and often they are also, uh, you know, it's a similar moment. They, they'll see Rebel Without a Cause or they'll discover later on that film about the same time. So for many, we have some you know, historical evidence that this is a pretty common uh, connection that many people are making, seeing these characters as uh, having a lot in common. Uh, so that's really a good, a good, good point to raise. Grace, let me ask, ask you a question. Was um, Catcher in the Rye and Rebel Without a Cause, were those two um, works instrumental in inventing adolescence? Because it seems to me, before the 50s, you went from being a high school student to, you know, you were in the army, uh, you were a man, you were married, you were an adult woman, you were married. But in the 50s, are we construct, is adolescence a kind of construct, construct that emerges in the 50s and then flowers in the 60s? Is that fair to say? Well, I, I would just tweak that a little bit. Um, there is a, a real sort of beginning of an intellectual and scholarly discussion about adolescence beginning at the end of the 19th century. Um, oh, and uh -huh. uh, there is a real kind of uh, flowering of this sort of moment between childhood and adulthood uh, for for well-off, for elite uh, Americans and Europeans uh, in boarding schools, in colleges and universities um, in the 1920s. So think about the um, the 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 flappers, the uh, people. Uh, people getting hold of automobiles for the first time uh, in large numbers in the United States, wealthy people, uh, and the use of cars and the creation of a kind of uh, fairly elite uh, uh, social life of young people mm -hmm. around automobiles and drinking and uh, going to speakeasies and, and jazz clubs. Oh, that's right. Uh, but <clears throat> I think what's different about the period, I don't think you're entirely wrong, Richard, because this is democratized in the post-World War II era. So by the 1950s, this kind of sort of break or pause or extended moment between childhood and adolescence is available to a lot more people. You know, it's really spreading through the middle class into the even the upper working class. Uh, so I think that there is a real key shift here. Adolescence mm -hmm. is, is not just for rich people anymore, I guess would be the <laughs> easy way to say it, yeah. um, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and that is a significant shift. Uh, and these characters are helping invent, maybe the better way to say it would be a middle class, a very broad middle class imagination of what adolescence is. Mm -hmm. We have a question, but is adolescence recognized across cultures? In some cultures, the teenager takes on the traits and responsibilities of adulthood, though we don't see this so much in Western culture? That's a good yes. question. I have no adolescence, idea. Adolescence is, um, is something that is very culturally particular. 
uh, which is not to say that other cultures in other times and places haven't imagined uh, the phases of life in ways that might map roughly onto the ways that uh, Americans are thinking about them in the time period this novel was written and even today. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, but, not, but certainly not all times and places. And in fact, uh, as the comment suggests, um, adolescence or this kind of extended childhood is fairly rare. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems to be getting longer in the U.S. I don't know if people want to comment on that, but <laughs> this uh, this seems to get get longer. It, it does. It it seems to all the time. Well, shall we move ahead? Yes, that's great. Um, so here we come, I think, to one of the central central issues of this uh, novel, and and I think again translated into different uh in a different idiom different keywords uh, uh, something that's very much on the minds of adolescents and young adults today as well even though they wouldn't necessarily use the word phony um this quote I i'll just read it after this maybe we'll just move through without reading them but this is such a terrific quote i can't help it lawyers are all right i guess but it doesn't appeal to me I mean, they're all right if they go around saving innocent guys' lives all the time and like that, but you don't do that kind of stuff if you're a lawyer. Even if you do go around saving guys' lives and all, how would you know if you did it because you really wanted to save guys' lives or because you did it because what you really wanted to do was to be a terrific lawyer with everybody slapping you on the back and congratulating you in court when the goddamn trial was over, the reporters and everybody, the way it is in the dirty movies. How would you know you weren't being a phony? The trouble is, you wouldn't. So much to talk about there, much to talk about there, but probably the best place to start is what is phoniness? What is this phoniness that Holden is describing here? Okay, <clears throat> how would we define phoniness? What is it? Uh, and if your students have any responses to that, if they can, they say some interesting things, let us know what your students tell us. Okay, so what is phoniness? Um, what strikes me about this is the extent that this par passage is the extent to which uh, Holden is so self-reflexive. I mean, he's really, you know, he's looking in and, and, and weighing his responses to all sorts of things. He's really being, uh, being very careful. Uh, I think that's terrific. Uh, I think he's being careful, but I think, at the, I think his speech is very character characteristic mm -hmm. of an adolescent. In the mm -hmm. sense that his speech is rambling, it yep. sort of circles in on itself, uh, uh, sort of comes to the end and then turns around and takes another slap at it. Uh, it seems very, um, to me, very characteristic of a kind of cadence and structure of, of voice of an adolescent. And I think, um, I think that's one of the amazing aesthetic contributions of this novel, of Salinger's. Mm -hmm capturing of that voice or creation of that voice might even be a better word because uh, there had not been a voice like this in fiction before Holden. Mm -hmm. We have some really interesting comments about phoniness. I think Holden defines phoniness as doing something, something for society and other people rather than being your authentic self. Another person uh, writes, um, my students think that phoniness is fear of truth. <clears throat> I think there might be a good connection to make between the way people portray themselves on Facebook and the way they actually are in real life. They are social media. Uh, yeah. Testing. I, and uh, Kara agrees with, uh, with Susan from above. So, uh, yeah, um, this, that's an interesting comment. Uh, let me see if I can get that one back up. It scrolled past me. Uh, Holden defines phoniness as doing something for society and other people rather than being your authentic self. We have some interesting comments here, Grace. What do you make of them? Um, I, I think they're all really terrific. Uh, uh, love the the comment about testing, which uh, which I think would be a digression for us perhaps here, but maybe in another forum. I'd love to hear what all the high school student teachers think about the testing. Uh, but but I, I think that. Um, this fear of society and doing things because other want other people want them to do you to mm -hmm. do them instead of actually doing what you yourself and your innermost self most want to do is is a really powerful uh, a theme in this novel um, and and I think the person who said fear of truth is also really getting at an aspect of of what uh, he means by phoniness which might be called in other times 
authenticity and inauthenticity or the real and the unreal. Uh, so, the, you know, I, I think that there's this tension between, uh, you know, thinking that you have to do what, you know, what is your, what is in yourself being true to your innermost self, but also um, how do you recognize that? How do you even know what that is if you're an adolescent? Uh, and how can you not respond to uh, the claims on you or the or the the responsibilities that uh, you face um, because you're connected to other people because you have family because you have friends because you are a part of society. So I think all of that's terrific. Uh, should we check in with what anybody else has to say? Um, yeah. <clears throat> Any other views of phoniness out there? But I do think that that whole question of the authentic self doing, you know, doing what you're motivated to do rather than what society expects you to do. I mean, you can carry that right theme you can carry that theme straight through to The Graduate, another film to pose against uh, Catcher in the Rye. Yes. Yes. Um, really powerful film. Can you show that to high school students? I don't, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I don't the, know. Um, <laughs> I'm not even sure you could show um, uh, Rebel Without a Cause. I don't know. We have a comment. I think this exemplifies how insecure Holden feels and inadequate. If someone is being nice to you, it is only because you are faking. Right. That's fantastic. Uh, really a sign of his alienation and his insecurity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I think one way of summarizing all of these different meanings of, of what is phony or inauthentic and what is authentic, what's real, what's unreal, is to think about the gap between representation and reality. I think that's one of the really powerful things that Holden is actually getting at here. How do you know if you're doing something because it's, you know, you want to be a terrific lawyer, or how do you know that, or what if you're doing it just so other people will think you're a terrific lawyer? Is this something that is real, or is this something that is some kind of a representation or a copy or one step or two steps removed from something that's real. And I, I, what I think is interesting about that is that's just a central question of modernist um, fiction, of literary fiction in this time period. And the way that Salinger can, through, through, the, through the consciousness of an adolescence, an, excuse me, an adolescent, get at this incredibly deep question uh, and relate it in a way that actually makes it seem very much a part of what adolescents are struggling with, but also it's uh, for many uh, novelists, writers, intellectuals in this time period, one of the really central intellectual questions of the age is really pretty profound. I, we have an interesting comment here. Given our <clears throat> uh, understanding about how this novel foreshadows social media, Lauren writes, I think if Holden were a teenager today, he would probably refuse to join Facebook or Instagram, uh, and probably would declare that that is a great bastion of phoniness. What do you think, Grace? Uh, I think that's really interesting, and I think that that that, that is likely to be true. Uh, that that's probably right. Um, one thing I do think is interesting, though, is would he would he if he were a teenager today not text? Would he not Snapchat? Would he not? Uh, I don't know. Tweeting may be over. Uh, you you uh, you are hanging out with more fifteen year and sixteen and seventeen year olds than I am, but uh, but I think that he would express his vision of his inner self if 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 in a selfie or a tweet. Um, but I but I think that's probably right. He might not he might not be on Facebook. And in response to your question about could you show the graduate to high school students, Carolyn writes, I do show parts of the graduate, only parts, to my high school students. So okay, if you're careful. Yes. You can get away with it. <laughs> That's terrific to know. That's terrific to know. And but Pat I, Marshall, uh, Holden, Holden would probably have a YouTube channel. That that's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> I think he would absolutely be uh, streaming video or images of himself somehow through whatever the latest uh, site is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, acting out, being shot in the guts. Uh, yeah. I do wonder how far his aversion for social media would go. He does a lot of phony exchanges with double dating, fencing, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. We're going we're gonna to get to that. Um, so many, several of you in your comments have brought up what I think, again, is a, a really powerful part of this novel, and that's the way that he um, sort of uses uh, popular culture to the movies, especially to 
act out and kind of express and also deflect his own emotions. Uh, many of you seem to be referring to that, and, and we're going to get that really soon. So uh, keep those thoughts in mind. Um, so I, I think that the novel then proceeds to try out a lot of different solutions to this, to this problem of the gap between the authentic and the inauthentic, the, the real and the unreal, and the question, the profound question of how do we know? How do we, how do we find out what is real? How can we know? Uh, so, uh, you know, to me, this is one way of really moving through the novel, thinking of the various uh, scenes as ways of that, that, that Holden is really trying out solutions. Um, and the first of these, it seems to me, we could characterize as life as a game. Uh, so the quote there, I think, refers to that, that sort of a vision of how you might navigate your adult life. Life is a game. Game my ass. I mean, Holden does love to cuss. Uh, it's some game. If you get on the side where all the hot shots are, then it's a game, all right. I admit that. But if you're on the other side where there aren't any hot shots, then what, what's a game about it? Nothing. No game. Anybody have any thoughts about that? Any... <clears throat> Any questions or comments about that? What what strikes me about that passage is that here is you have he seems to, to to express a sympathy for the people on the other side, the people who do not live in the world of the hotshots, which of course he does. His family, you know, they're in Manhattan uh, and they live among the hotshots. He doesn't. So does this betray a sympathy for the underdog here? Uh, I. I think we're waiting to hear if others respond or Richard, okay, we have, yeah. uh, you can respond to that, but we have Lauren writes, you can't lose if you choose not to play. Very good comment. Fantastic. Uh, and uh, a very, I think, really characteristic uh, adolescent answer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, not to play is a, not the, not the, not Lauren's comment, excuse me, but the, the message there that the adolescent chooses not to play. Uh, yeah, is a, is a terrific one. Um, yeah, we have some other comments coming in. But back to my question: do, Does do you think this does betray a kind of sympathy for the underdog here, Grace? Yeah, I think that you see that really throughout uh, this story. Um, you know, this is a kid who's who's lived a pretty sheltered life, um, despite the fact that he's growing up in 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 the city in New York City. Uh, in his various adventures on his own for those few days, mm -hmm. you get a sense of him as very sheltered. But you also get a sense of him as, um, at least uh, in his encounters with people, uh, despite his snarky sort of voice that he gives himself and his recollection of this time, being really pretty empathetic to a lot of the characters, or the people, excuse me, the people that mm -hmm. he meets that become the characters in the story. Uh, and uh, a sympathy for the underdog would be a really powerful way of putting that. Uh, I think that he, you know, I think it's too much to say he has a sense of his class privilege, but I think uh. he definitely, I think he definitely is trying to get there. You know, he's 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 got sympathy for people that he sees as um, as somehow being uh, being oppressed by the situation. Uh, we're going to come to those scenes in a minute. I can think of the scene with the prostitute, uh, the scene when he has a date. Uh, yeah. So you, you, I think you, you do see him developing that kind of consciousness. Maybe not all, not there yet. I would say. Right. And at the very end of the novel, when he's talking about being the catcher in the rye, he's expressing great sympathy for for the vulnerable little children. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We have. Pat Marshall writes, there is an implied understanding of the odds stacked against those who aren't hotshots. That's a big reason why my students respond to him. Yeah, I think this is a reflection of how he sees life. He can never win. Can you respond to those uh, comments, Grace? Well, I, I think that, that the, the comment that this is why students respond to him, I think that, that that's really, really perceptive. I, I think that's why um, that's why there's something lovable beneath the, the cursing, snarky voice, uh, and that sort of sense of sympathy and deep empathy. It doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, feel like it's it. Excuse me to use the language of the novel is phony, um, but it seems uh, it seems like 
uh, despite his fear of phoniness, he's found something real. And I think that's really something that makes him, over the course of the novel, a character you can like. So I think that's really terrific. Um, I, I think he does see himself in that moment as not being able to win, or in the time period that he's describing as he recalls these, these days from this point in the future when he's looking back. Uh, and I think that comes back to what somebody said at the very beginning about the opening, his sense of, of alienation, and something that we people wouldn't have talked about in the 1950s and 60s in terms of depression and the way we would talk about it now. Uh, but, but I think it's, it's fair to call it that. Uh, so not that he, he won't ever win in his life. I think we have the knowledge to know that this is a moment. He's an adolescent, but he very much is feeling that kind of sense that he's never going to win. Okay, well, shall we move on to possible solution two? Yes. So this solution um, I've described as seeing uh, life as art. Uh, another solution on offer in the same uh, scene, and that is um, the possibility of some kind of deep and meaningful adult membership, mentorship. So I'm not going to read this quote because it's a rather long one, except for just to point you to the middle of the quote when uh, Holden, who's, of course, supposedly so depressed and downtrodden that he's reached out to this teacher, gone to his apartment in New York City, and reached out to him for help out of his desperation. And yet when the teacher is describing him or saying to him what he should do, giving him a very, what the teacher thinks of as a very profound speech, uh, and again, I find this to be such a wonderful sort of capturing of, of, of adolescence, uh, he corrects him. Uh, no, it's not Mr. It's not the Mr. Vineses. It's Mr. Vincent's. <laughs> you, know, you know. So there, Holden is in the middle of this scene, interrupting uh, his uh, teacher and correcting him and, and telling him the right pr pronunciation. It's a really terrific to me little 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 quality there in that quote. Well, I've forgotten. Anybody <clears throat> have anything to say about this one? Any any comments on this one? I, I have I have to confess my memory of the novel is a little foggy here. How does Holden respond to what the teacher is saying? Because what the teacher is saying, he's, you know, it's fairly confident. He's trying to tell him, you know, don't worry, you'll get over this. You're no, you're not alone on this score. You'll be excited and stimulated to know many, many men have just been uh, have been just as troubled morally and spiritually as you are right now. How, I've forgotten. How does he respond to this? Does he just write this well, off as more phoniness? I'm going to go to the next slide just because okay. it's the end of this. It's the oh, end okay. of the same quote. Mm -hmm. Right. You'll learn from them if you want to, just as someday if you have something to offer, someone will learn something from you. It's a beautiful reciprocal arrangement, and it isn't education. It's history. It's poetry. Well, on a certain meta level, what's lovely about that quote is that's, of course, what the whole novel does, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in the novel, um, that, that does happen. <laughs> but in the actual course of the story, uh, Holden... Um, uh, really doesn't have much of a chance to respond in a positive way to this uh, this uh, this reaching out. Um, does anybody remember what happens in this moment? Uh, has anybody read the read the novel recently enough that you remember what what happens? Yes, I think it's coming back to me. Now, this is Mr. Antonelli. What does Mr. Antolini do? Antolini, right, right. What does he do? Uh, he, Holden gets his head patted, and then um, maybe something a little more. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, it, it it seems to be a sexual advance. Yeah, yeah. Or a suggested advance, um, and you know, I don't think that's going to shock many high school students today, but uh, certainly a radical, uh, radical uh, thing to write into a into this type of a novel at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, anybody have anything to say about that? Because I think that, you know, this is a really great speech. And this is the kind of speech that I actually sort of make to my college students today when they come into my office and they're, and they're depressed and worried about the future. Uh, I, I, I hope I make it a little bit less haughtily, but nevertheless, uh, I, I think it, it, it's, it's a message that some of us may actually 
find useful, but for Holden, it's really undercut. Right. It undercuts everything Antolini says and deposits it in the realm of phoniness. Carolyn writes, my students generally don't like this part. It makes them very uncomfortable. And I can understand that. Yes, yes I, I can too. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's a great, great uh, moment to talk about how fiction can work that way. You know, how, how, how books can make us uncomfortable. And here we have another comment. Uh, Meredith Murphy writes, on one hand, <clears throat> it's another time that Holden reaches out for truth from an adult and comes away dissatisfied, even betrayed. Yes, terrific. So Absolutely. adult mentors uh, may not be the way to go. Yes. Mr. Antolini is not the only one. I've, I've used him to illustrate, really, uh, a series of, of, of these kinds of reaching out to adult moments in this, in this story. But that's a really wonderful comment, and it's exactly, exactly right. Uh, he uh, comes away dissatisfied, disappointed, uh, feeling like uh, the adults really don't have any answers for him. All right, so maybe we can go on yeah, to the sure. next possible go ahead. solution. And that is uh, finding a, a solution to this, this problem of figuring out what's real and what's unreal uh, and the gap between the two uh, by taking refuge in sex and physical intimacy. Uh, seems like uh, something that's, uh, though it's been a long time since the novel was written, uh, this doesn't seem to have diminished in adolescent life uh, uh, or at least the desire for it uh, in my, my, my uh, experience. Um, so we have this moment when uh, he is talking about Jane Gallagher, who's a girl that he knows and, and, and uh, has feelings for, who he describes all the time as keeping her kings in the back row when she plays checkers, uh, which I think is really a lovely detail about her. You don't always have to get too sexy to get to know a girl. Every time you do some, they do something pretty, even if they're not too much to look at or even if they're sort of stupid, you fall half in love with them and then you never know where the hell you are. So I'll just, just open that up for comments. How, how do you teach this part of the story? <clears throat> how do your students respond to his relationship with Jane? Uh, Again, I think this speaks to his emotional confusion. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't know what he feels. Um, he wants to uh, to connect uh, with girls, but they are very confusing to him. We've got some comments coming through. I was about to say sex is confusing to adolescents, but then I thought to myself, who is sex not confusing to? <laughs> <laughs> so. I, I, uh, I think that might be one of those things that transcends all things <laughs> yeah. in life. Well, the confusion sets in at adolescence, you know, or it begins to at any rate. It, and it never stops, right? <laughs> oh, here's a good comment. My student asks asked me what necking was. <clears throat> they are urban students, so the language was different. And That's fantastic. <laughs> well, how did you explain that, Kara? I'd be interested to know. Uh, he is confused. Uh, society tells him that real men have sex with many women. He doesn't know how to respond. To high school teachers know a great deal about. Yes, I think that's right. But and it also, I think, at the same time, and I love always that sort of rich multiplicity in Salinger suggests what you were getting at earlier, Richard, about his empathy, his 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 growing kind of sense of connection and sympathy for for other people for how they how they might be affected if he goes through the world just going for what he wants mm -hmm. you know if on the one hand he's supposed to to do what he thinks in his in himself he wants and he should do what if that actually hurts somebody else you know how is he supposed to figure that out yeah yeah well, it's, it's good to know <clears throat> that high school students uh, still use the term making out, as Kara just informed us. So uh, <laughs> that's reassuring well, in, it, in an odd way. I don't, I don't know if that, probably this is high school too, but this term hooking up, which, which just <laughs> morphs constantly and has meanings that go from, you know, something that would mean we're going to make a connection and you know, decide to go have a coffee together to, you know, <laughs> 
the, yes. the most pornographic exchange you can imagine is is my my particular favorite. I somebody says hooking up, I just start backing up. I don't know <laughs> what they're talking about. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah. we have another, another scene, another uh, uh, almost sex scene um, that I think is is getting also at this possible solution that f sexual intimacy and physical intimacy could be to this problem of trying to figure out what's real and what's authentic. Uh, and bring, really, this scene, I think, brings up a lot of the issues that we've been talking about. It's a really powerful scene between Holden and uh, the prostitute, Sonny, and then uh, 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 she brings in her, her pimp, um, Maurice. Um, this is a pretty long uh, It starts after after, uh, after uh, for those who just, you know, just to refresh your memory, uh, Holden doesn't have sex with Sonny, uh, and then he offers to pay her anyway, but she goes and gets her pimp, and they come back, and uh, she steals some money from Holden, the pimp hits him in the stomach, and then Holden begins this sort of reverie where he's imagining himself uh, as a character in a, a, a kind of gangster movie. So I'll just give you a chance to, to look at the scene, read the scene before we talk about it. Oh, we can put it on the table. Why don't I read it and uh, everybody will, will have it out there and we can all uh, be on the same page. Fantastic. When I finally... Next slide, too. Okay. When I finally get up, I had to walk to the bathroom all doubled up and holding onto my stomach and all. But I'm crazy. I swear to God I am. About halfway to the bathroom, I sort of start pretending I had a bullet in my guts. Old Maurice had plugged me. Now I was on the way to the bathroom to get a good shot of bourbon or something to steady my nerves and help me really go into action. I pictured myself coming out of the goddamn bathroom dressed and all with my automatic in my pocket and staggering around a little bit. Then I'd walk downstairs instead of using the elevator. I'd hold on to the banister and all with this blood trickling out of the side of my mouth a little at a time. What I'd do, I'd walk down a few floors holding onto my guts, blood leaking all over the place, and then I'd ring the elevator bell. As soon as old Maurice opened the door, he'd see me with the automatic in my hand, and he'd start screaming at me in his very high-pitched voice to leave him alone. But I'd plug him anyway. All right, so here's the next one. Six shots right through his fat, hairy belly. Then I'd throw my automatic down the elevator shaft after I'd wiped off all the fingerprints and all. Then I'd crawl back to my room and call up Jane and have her come over and bandage up my guts. I pictured her holding a cigarette for me to smoke while I was bleeding and all. The goddamn movies, they can ruin you. I'm not kidding. I stayed in the bathroom for about an hour, taking a bath and all. Then I got back in bed. It took me quite a while to go to sleep. I wasn't even tired, but finally I did. I felt like jumping out the window. I probably would not would have done it, too. If I hadn't, if I'd been sure, somebody would cover me up as soon as I landed. I didn't want a bunch of stupid rubbernecks looking at me when I was all gory. <clears throat> well, one version of adulthood, I suppose. Now, we have some comments. Um, let's see. Lauren writes, he's confused. Society tells him what real men... Oh, that's what we've already looked at that. Okay, uh, here we go. The, this quote uh, reflects uh, back on the idea of representation versus reality. Okay, theme in the novel. Okay, Grace, what... what uh, how should we approach this with our students? Well, here we have another quote. Well, let me let me just get this on the table first. Well, this quote brings up the question of adolescence being half child and half adult. If he is a child, he is just being imaginative. If he's an adult, he has a mental illness, fantasies, and delusions of grandeur. Good point. Good point. Okay, Grace, what do you make of that? Um, I think this is this is really great. I mean, you know, on on a certain level, here's another you know failed attempt to connect. Right? This is an attempt to have a sexual connection, but once again. He's failed, and you know, and Sonny doesn't even turn out to really be an adult, which is part of the reason he he fails. So that relates back to some of the things we were talking about. But the comment, which is a great one, that this too is really getting at this idea of representation versus reality, um, is that you know this is a really detailed description, uh, and this is a, a very sort of specific description of what he's imagining happened and what he'd do, what the other people would do, and how he would he would act, and, and suggesting even how he would feel. And it's really uh, interesting that this is all taken from 
from uh, from the movies, from uh, popular culture, uh, from uh, a kind of gangster film narrative, um, and and that uh, he is uh, here, of course, being that very thing that he spends so much of the novel decrying. In a certain sense, he's being phony. He's using this this pop culture story to uh, to give meaning, to flesh out something uh, that has happened to him, that he's feelings uh, and actions that he's not comfortable with. But on the other hand, this is a moment of, of real authenticity in this story. This is a moment where he's really trying to, to say something uh, about, about his reaction to what has happened with Maurice and Sonny. So I think it's really, really a powerful, powerful uh, scene in the story. Along those lines, Grace, Meredith Murphy writes, he is clearly disappointed with the way that he handled the situation, so he has to fantasize an honorable way to absolve himself of this failure. Absolutely. That's an interesting way of looking at it, yeah. Absolutely. And Carrie writes, having not yet taught this, I wonder how many students could connect to a person with such dramatic thoughts, but not acting on them. So many of our young folks act on these thoughts. Oh, my God. Holden as a model citizen. Gulp. Yeah, that, well, that is kind of scary. I guess, I mean, I think that's true on one level, and I don't want to abs absolutely, you know, don't want to suggest that we want students to have these kind of violent thoughts. And, but on the other hand, I think if you think about how common it is in our own time for people to sort of both express and deflect their complicated emotions through popular mass cultural forms, and I'm thinking here especially of teenagers and young adults' investment in fandoms, and how they mm -hmm. spend so much of their leisure hours, at least it, it seems to me, some of us might say too much of their leisure hours, um, reading fan fiction, uh, uh, swapping stories and, and images with other fans of, of, of fiction series and television series and movies and all the, the different things in popular culture that fandoms are arranged around and how they're using those characters and those stories and those images to express or to try to sort through or, or, and also sometimes, as I said, to deflect their own complicated emotions. I mean, this seems mm -hmm. to me to be very characteristic of our own uh, culture. And I think when, when, uh, when Salinger was writing this, uh, really not such a common move, or at least not something that you saw uh, fictional char characters doing. Um, however much people may or may not have been doing it in the in the real world, they weren't. People weren't talking about their emotions or 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 thinking about things uh, visibly out in the world in this way. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting aspect of this story: the way that he uses popular culture. Whenever he gets really anxious and wants to say something, he goes into into some kind of a, a, a popular culture scene. It's like he just almost like he steps into a scene from a movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is interesting. He, he he rails against phoniness, and yet when he tries to interpret his own experience, he relies on Hollywood, the you know the ultimate bastion of phoniness, which his brother is writing for. Exactly. So he is aware of the phoniness in Hollywood. Yeah. So it's it's interesting. Here, Pat Marshall gives us a good teaching idea. There are lots of great nonfiction articles dealing with the effect of media on teens. I found it very helpful to partner one or more of these articles with the text at this point. That's Pat, great. if you would, if you could enter into the form some of those articles you'd use, I'm sure our uh, participants would like to uh, to see them. Uh, Meredith Murphy writes, to make an admittedly old pop culture reference, Macaulay Culkin turns to gangster movies as inspiration for protecting himself from bad guys in the Home Alone movies. Coming up all sorts of movie illusions tonight. That's a great reference, and I think that you, you if you start looking for this, um, this kind of uh, uh, use of pop culture in in uh, a plot of an of a of an item of popular culture, if you want to think about that way, a novel, a movie. Um, it it it's a certainly a growing uh, trend across our time, uh, really resulting in the kind of meta popular culture that we have, like The Simpsons. See, I'm going to make old references, too, so sorry. <laughs> the Simpsons, I'm thinking of, or even Finding Nemo is the first kids' movie I remember to have so many different levels of reference uh, uh, in the film to other popular culture. 
it's really a, a kind of aesthetic of our time. But it, but again, I think it's interesting to see how it's how it's new when Salinger's doing it. Okay, folks, uh, remember to take a look at the forum because Pat Marshall will post bibliography of articles tomorrow when she has access to her school computer. So check back in that forum for some useful teaching material. Yeah, that's hey, Grace, shall we move ahead? Yeah, thank you for that. I'm going to look for those articles too. So this slide was really just stating that, uh, that point, so I think we can just move. Oops, sorry, I don't know what I just did there. Um, trying again to move forward. Okay, so... This is uh, the last, at least, of the possible solutions to this problem of alienation and the authentic versus the unauthentic that, that I'm going to discuss. And if others have uh, other possible solutions that are being uh, investigated in the novel, please feel free, free to bring them up after we go over this last one, which is family. Certainly a very uh, 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 powerful uh, way in which many of us uh, feel connected to each other, feel connected to the world. Uh, have a sense of what's real and what's important is through our interactions with and connections to our families. Uh, Richard, you did such a great job of reading that other quote. Can I call on you to read this one too? Sure, <clears throat> sure. This attests to Holden, Holden Caulfield's influence on me. <laughs> Boy, it began to rain like a bastard in buckets, I swear to God. All the parents and mothers and everybody went over and stood right under the roof of the carousel so they didn't, wouldn't get soaked to the skin or anything. But I stuck around on the bench for quite a while. I got pretty soaking wet, especially my neck and pants. My hunting hat really gave me quite a lot of protection in a way, but I got soaked anyway. I didn't care, though. I felt so damn happy all of a sudden, the way old Phoebe kept going round and round. I was damn near bawling. I felt so damn happy. If you want to know the truth, I don't know why. I was just It was just that she looked so damn nice, the way she kept going round and round in her blue coat and all. God, I wish you could have been there. That's terrific. So, you know, there's again much to talk about here, but uh, at the level of the, the imagery, the symbolism, um, I just love the carousel, uh, the, the image of the carousel, uh, the, the movement in a circle, uh, the way that the voice kind of goes up and down, even as he's describing the carousel going up and down. Again, I think the way that Holden's language is often cir circular and the carousel is obviously going in a circle. But I think at, at the level of the story, the way this image of a circle cuts against the linear flow of time, and really you could think about that circle cutting across or circling around stopping time, arresting time. And I, I, to me, part of what makes him... Uh, have this moment with Phoebe, Phoebe's going round and round, is that, you know, if time stops, then Phoebe's not going to grow up, and even more importantly, then, and he's not going to grow up, Holden's not going to have to grow up, but also their brother Allie wouldn't be dead. Uh, anybody want to comment on this this scene? We, we have a good comment here from Meredith Murphy. Murphy. <clears throat> he finally sees an expression of authentic emotion. It is something he has been craving throughout the novel. Childhood is also a frequent source of comfort. We remember our own innocence. That's terrific. So he see he he feels like at least in his in his sense anyway. We don't really know what Phoebe thinks herself, mm -hmm. but he sees her as having this genuine happiness that he can share. That's great. Mm -hmm. We have some other comments coming through uh, the chat. Um, but I, I like the <clears throat> the contradiction in, in there too. Uh, um, I got pretty soaking wet, especially my neck and pants. My hunting my hunting hat really gave me quite a lot of protection, uh, in a way. But I got soaked anyway. So. Yeah, this is <laughs> one of the characteristics of Holden's speech throughout the novel, um, and I think it's something really fun to have the students look for and pick out is the way that he contradicts him, contradicts himself. He contradicts mm -hmm. himself mm -hmm. all the time. You could make a page list, you know, a, fill up a notebook with his contradictions, and that's a great one right there. It protected him, but he's soaking wet anyway. Uh, yeah. yeah. And Susan writes, <clears throat> I, like, I like how happiness just comes upon him. Even though he has been depressed, he can still recognize the pure happiness. he recognizes it in part because or I think he is able to recognize it because he loves Phoebe so much because this mm -hmm. is somebody he actually is open to that he is not alienated from right. 
And that's actually, it's not perhaps that he's nobody else around him is ever having any authentic emotions. It's just that he can't actually share them or see them or, or somehow uh, know that they're real. But in this scene, uh, and in this particular moment anyway, family might actually be working for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, and Phoebe <clears throat> is not a phony. I mean, he, he, um, she's innocent, she's young, um, uncorrupted by the world. She is not a phony. And, and he can perceive at any rate that her joy is real. We, as you said, we don't know how she, she responds to it, but uh, we see how he responds to it. Some more questions coming across. Uh, Lauren writes, children are the most authentic individuals. Phoebe reminds him of that. And we have some others. Uh, I think we, we have a couple more slides on the turn to the family, Grace. Would you like to move ahead? Yeah. Uh, so this is, of course, the scene uh, from which the novel gets its, uh, its, its name, its title. Uh, and uh, Richard, if I can press upon you one more time, maybe you could do okay. this for us. <clears throat> you know that song, If a Body Catch a Body Coming Through the Rye? I keep picturing all these little kids playing some game in this big field of rye and all. Thousands of little kids and nobody's around, nobody big. I mean, except me. And I'm standing on the edge of some crazy cliff. What I have to do, I have to catch everybody if they start to go over the cliff. I mean, if they're running and they don't want to look where they're going, I have to come out from somewhere and catch them. That's all I do all day. I just be the catcher in the rye and all. This this uh, this scene this last time I read this book this uh, this actually made me a little bit weepy I don't remember feeling that mm -hmm. when I was about eighteen and read it but 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 now so you're like hold you're like hold and you're bawling and you don't know why exactly uh, or I'm bawling and I'm I'm dry all at the same time uh, <laughs> but but I think this here we have again an image of of, of circularity of return of stopping time um, and also of of Holden, this comes back to some of the things you guys were saying at the beginning of our discussion, really terrific uh, comments about his desire to be in control, I think, in this, in this mm -hmm. course, his fantasy of how he would save his brother. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what's interesting here is that no one is around to congratulate him. If a lawyer did this and people congratulated the lawyer, that would introduce phoniness, but he's by himself. So he's doing this purely for himself. There's no social display. Nobody can be there to inject uh, an element of phoniness. This is pure um, idealism, care, whatever, love. Um, see here, um, we have uh, his desire to be needed, to be necessary for the children. Yes. Uh, and then maybe this is my special ed background coming through, but he's interpreting symbols rather literally. Yeah. Okay. The catcher in the rye. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. after all, it's a it's a Burns poem. He's he's not even quoting it exactly mm -hmm. right, but yes, he's interpreting it very literally. And I think right. in that sense, we have yet again one of those glimpses of holding the child. Uh, mm -hmm. so that's that's really terrific. Uh, way of thinking about it that you've that you've raised and mm -hmm. and i think the self-consciousness of this character holden i mean that's you know he'll know he's pure if he's alone but also he's so self-conscious he's so second guess himself he's always moving in circles so if he's alone you know that that in a sense uh he'll he, he won't be totally alone right he's saving the children but no other adults around yeah to, no, nobody big, I mean, except me. And and this is a very, he's envisioning for himself a very adult role here. I mean, he, this is a parental role. Right. Uh, and, you know, we have, we didn't talk about it specifically, but the adults that fail him, of course, include his parents because mm -hmm. uh, they don't understand him. Uh, a very typical adolescent complaint. And they mm -hmm. also, uh, I think even more powerfully for this story, are not able to save Allie. Yeah. Yeah. And also, too, <clears throat> another detail, these are young children. These, you know, an adolescent would, wouldn't probably want the catcher in the ride to get in his way. He'd want to get to the closest as possible to the edge of that cliff. But these are little children. These are kids like Phoebe. Right. Um, they're not phonies. Right. Right. And like Allie with his baseball mitt. Uh, right. So. Uh, so we have one more uh, one more of these uh, scenes with his family. 
Uh, I'll try to live up to the standard uh, Richard has set. I knew my mother'd get nervous as hell and start to cry and beg me to stay home and not go back to my cabin, but I'd go anyway. I'd be casual as hell. I'd ask them all to visit me sometime if they wanted to, but I wouldn't insist or anything. What I'd do, I'd let old Phoebe come out and visit me in the summertime and on Christmas vacation and Easter vacation, and I'd let D.B. come, but he couldn't write any movies in my cabin, only stories and books. I'd have this rule that nobody could do anything phony when they visited me. If anybody tried to do anything phony, they couldn't stay. So this, I think, is uh, really interesting as, a, as his fantasy uh, of how the family might work for, for him. Uh, he would uh, be in connection with them, but on his terms. He would be living away from them, outside of society, outside of their control, in his own cabin. Uh, he's not even sure he's going to even tell them where he is when he first goes there. Um, but he's going anyway. Uh, there's one of those wonderful contradictions. Old Phoebe, right? Because she's certainly not old. Uh, she mm -hmm. can come out uh, and DB. Um, so in this fantasy, uh, uh, he can have a connection with his family. But I think it's interesting with separation on his own terms, all of those kind of qualifications in place. Yeah, and then we have that allusion there to <clears throat> DB writing movies, the right. You know, the irony, once again, that he interprets his experience through movies, and yet he disdains them. Right. And, of course, what happens is that Phoebe wants to go with him when he's going to run away, and, uh, and thus he uh, puts aside this fantasy uh, because he uh, doesn't want, uh, you know, doesn't think that it's, it's, it's right to take her away uh, with him. And I think ultimately in the novel, family doesn't really work as a solution uh, for Holden's alienation and his attempt to find the real, uh, sort out what's real from, from what's uh, phony, uh, in large part because of the death of Allie. Um, the death of Allie, and, and much more secondarily, but also there, his sense of estrangement from his older brother, D.B. Do we have uh, comments here? Uh, we have some, I don't see anything coming over the chat, but what again strikes me here, strikes me here again, is that he is alone. So it seems to be that when you're alone, you can be authentic. Phoniness becomes a possibility when you're in society because society responds to you and then you've got to judge that response. Is it authentic? Is it not authentic? Is it something I've done? It, it, society raises questions for him while when he's alone, he can feel authentic. Right. So in the end here, I think, at the end of the novel, Holden, like a million middle class, and as some of you said, entitled, bratty, snarky, all those words uh, apply, uh, but like a million teenagers uh, before and after him survives, um, and he rebels. Uh, it seems to me that he sees rebellion against the world's compromises as the only way to fight the phoniness, the only way to act morally, and the only way in the end to live. Um, but I think one of the things that's really interesting about the framing, just to take us back to where we started this discussion, is what is never phony, what is not phony uh, in this uh, entire novel, is the telling of the tale. Uh, Holden's recollection, his memory of these few days that happened to him in the past, um, we find out over the course of the novel that he's narrating this story from a mental institution uh, where he has gone after having a breakdown. Uh, so it seems to me that the ultimate sort of meta narrative is telling us that it's only in the telling of the story, in the relating your life with its contradictions, with its phony moments, with its real moments. It's in the telling of your story, your, your autobiography, if you will, your selfie, um, that a uh, connection can be created, uh, that you can create some kind of bond with other people. Um, and that bond uh, is with that imagined audience, with those people who are out there somewhere, whoever they are that you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. Meredith has a, <clears throat> an interesting comment here. Every adolescent fantasizes about separating from family, but Holden finds that the emotional ties are really binding. And then Teresa writes, family is always the solution. Adolescents today think anything that older people do is phony. And so why is Catcher still on the banned book list in schools 
today. Uh, how would you respond to those comments, Grace? Uh, well, uh, I, I absolutely agree with Meredith that uh, all uh, adults, uh, maybe we'll get Richard to tell us about his own childhood. Uh, maybe somebody else can be autobiographical, but I, I imagine many of us can imagine, can remember moments when we, we had our own fantasies about separating from family uh, and striking out on our own. Um, and, and I think that's absolutely correct that, that for Holden, the ties are binding in, in, in large part because uh, his family's already lost Allie. And, uh, you know, that makes it uh, both very, very difficult for him to be in the family, but also very problematic for him to leave. Um, so, so I think that's really terrific. Also, the comment that families are always the solution, uh, this is certainly a message I can get behind and, and I agree with that. And yes, adolescents, it is amazing how they think everything we do is phony and yet still uh, ban the book. I mean, there's really, I can't add to that, Teresa. That's, that's pretty much speaks for itself as a, as a terrific comment. Um, uh -huh. But well, we, we have, added, we... sometimes family is the problem. You know what? I, that's really, that's really a, a, a very wise point. Um, uh, I guess I, I, let me just back up and say that by saying family is the solution, what I mean by that is some uh, group of people that you can make a connection with, that you can have some kind of trust or faith in, uh, is a solution. <laughs> but your actual birth family will necessarily be the place that you find those connections, if I can just uh, put it that way uh, in response to the comment. Sometimes family is the problem. I think that's correct. But, but if, if adolescents can't find uh, other people to fill in for those roles, uh, then, then connection is really not possible. Mm -hmm. And yeah. <clears throat> following along on what you said, Marina writes, family doesn't have to be the traditional family. It can be anybody you would consider a family. And here's yet another uh, connection. <clears throat> I just read Into the Wild. Excuse me, my voice is disappearing. But can't help, <clears throat> can't help but draw connections between Holden and Chris McCandless. That I, that yes, yes, that is an excellent comparison. That's that's really terrific. Um, I you know the book that I wrote about outsiders. I started with Catcher in the Rye and I ended with Chris McCandless. So yeah. I, I I I absolutely agree with that point. I think Chris McCandless is Holden. You know, fifty years later, um, and in many ways in in a lot more trouble. Um, the thing about Holden, you have to remember throughout the story, is his parents live in New York City, and he has a key to the apartment. Um, this might get back to how some of our students might. I mean, he has literally the key and symbolically the key. He can go home. Uh, so I think that is something important to say that we haven't brought out in the discussion yet. But uh, Chris McCandless uh, ends up getting himself into a situation uh, that he that he can't get out of that he can't go home from and uh, really I, 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 I think that would be an amazing pairing if you could pair those two narratives uh, I don't know if you can teach into the wild in high school but those those stories really fit together in very interesting ways mm -hmm. well uh, Grace I think we have one more slide and we can wrap things up We're getting on to the yes. end of our 90 minutes yes um, so I wanted to just return us here to the end um, to think about the ways that uh, Catcher in the Rye, uh, through its uh, tremendous popularity, uh, especially after the paperback version comes out in 1953, uh, with its lurid cover, uh, Richard reminded me of a really interesting article recently in The New Yorker about the paperback publishing revolution by Lewis Manan. So I refer you to that because it has an actual picture of the paperback cover of Catcher in the Rye uh, uh, that's, that, that's pretty, pretty sensationalized. But when this book comes out as a paperback in 53, it becomes a really huge seller. And this novel then really, in a sense, goes on to become an actor in our history, in the history that has happened ever since the novel came out. Um, and one effect of the, this novel, I think, is um, we live in a contemporary media-saturated world. Um, and, and I think more than ever before, more than when this novel was published in the 50s, uh, we live in a time when uh, we know that we're real in our acts and our moments of self-expression. Uh, this seems to me to be, at least, and I'd love to hear your feedback, 
part of what makes um, social media so popular, um, whatever the particular sites that are popular with our students are at the moment. Um, but those ways of sharing uh, what they think of as aspects of themselves, that's how they're making themselves. That's how they're figuring out who they are. And that's exactly what Holden is doing. It's trying to connect through and make himself through self-expression. Um, but I think it's good to talk to students about what are the limitations uh, of this way of understanding the self. You know, that there's things about it that are good, but what are the limitations? The second major impact I think we can see here is on the sort of subsequent development of literature and in more recent times the development of the genre of young adult fiction. And I ask you guys, uh, I'm just going to throw it out there, we may not have time to get to it, but I'd uh, be interested to hear uh, people's thoughts if we have time. If this novel was published today, would it be published in the young adult category? Uh, it seems to me uh, that the publisher would probably insist uh, knowing what we know about Salinger, he'd probably fight back, but uh, still something to ponder. Um, this is a book, I would say, that helps to create that genre of young adult fiction. And then uh, the other uh, a couple of points, um, fandoms. I think these are very powerful forces in teenagers' lives today, um, and these kinds of borrowings from pop culture we can see uh, early examples of. Uh, this use of pop culture to express and deflect emotions in this novel. Uh, and then finally, the ubiquity uh, of the snarky, alienated teenager, young adult character. Uh, you know, Holden doesn't even stand out today, which might make it hard, I think, for our, for our students to take away from it uh, any kind of a sense of reading it in the time period that it came out. Uh, they, they certainly will have a different relationship to the novel uh, but at the same time, uh, that can be its own powerful relationship. Uh, seeing this snarky character at its moment of birth is, is, is pretty interesting. Well, in response to your question about young adult fiction, <clears throat> Kara writes, if Catcher isn't young adult, I don't know what is. So uh, I, I agree. It seems to, yeah, it seems to have invented that category, right? Yeah. I wonder, um, I'm not familiar with young adult fiction, but would the language be off-putting for the young adult category? It's holding well, this, as, as Grace noted, can know, be pretty salty. I have to say that I, I, my, you know, I don't study young adult fiction, but I've read a lot of it because I try to read a lot of the books that my own kids read, and I hear them talking about the books. And, and my take on it is that there's a lot of... Uh, of, of uh, pretty rich uh, material in young adult fiction. I'd like to hear from some of the teachers, though, that might have an even better sense of it than I do. Well, Kara endorses that. My students related better with Holden because of the language. So, yeah, <laughs> talk about phoniness and authenticity. Uh, at least his language is authentic for our young adult uh, <laughs> students today. My daughter, my daughter told, tells me that she learned every every word I don't want her to say in a very young age on the school bus. So there's oh, no going back. Well, there you go. <clears throat> no, there isn't any going back. Okay, and here we have, when we are about three-fourths of the way through, we read Slight Rebellion off Madison, and my students are always struck how much more gentle Holden is. Um, you might want... A, um, Grace, you might want to tell us about that slight rebellion off Madison. That appeared in the New Yorker, I think, originally back in '46. Is that right? Yeah, that's one of the early, um, one of the the places where Salinger is working out uh, this character, early appearance of uh -huh. a character like Holden. I, I don't believe he's named Car Holden. Uh, maybe Caroline can weigh in on that. I, I I think that the character has a different name, but absolutely uh, much more gentle. Um, the, the the anger in Holden comes out in his in his cursing and in his language, uh, but not in his actions so much. Uh, and I think uh, you really have a, a very a much more um, sympathetic character than the character in Slight Rebellion off Madison, a similar character. And here. <clears throat> um... Linda writes, I think the language is absolutely offensive. It is way too heavy for me for my high school students. So there we have a, a different of opinion. So it might not, you know, for some young, for some young adults, it would not be appropriate. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our seminar. Let me ask, are there any final 
comments? Have we answered all of your questions here before we uh, shut the classroom down? Uh, I read this book in the 10th grade and my teacher wrote fuck on the board and told us to get over it because it was just a word. <laughs> uh, my teachers weren't writing that on the board when I was. Yeah. <clears throat> um, that is a very interesting teacher. <laughs> I, I would have liked to have had that teacher as a high school teacher. <laughs> uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen. So we've come to the end of our seminar. Grace, I want to thank you very much. This has been an excellent seminar. I've learned a lot, and I think we've given our participants a lot to think about and a lot to take to their classes, probably tomorrow morning if they're teaching catchers. Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to say thanks to everyone that weighed in with their comments because I learned a lot too. It was really, uh, really terrifically inspiring and, and really at times a lot of fun as well. So thank you. Well, I told you uh, a lot of people want to talk like uh, Holden. So here Carolyn writes, sleep tight, you morons. So <laughs> I think we Fantastic. will. That all is right. good. Thank so ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let me thank all of you for your participation. You have really been excellent participants tonight. We've had a lot of excellent chat, great seminar. So please remember to check that form. Pat Marshall is going to put some teaching material in there for you. We'll monitor the form until January 30th. And by that, I mean that we'll, we'll look at it. And if there are any interesting comments, questions, we'll pass them on to Grace for her response. So thank you all very much. Uh, please check AmericaInClass.org for our upcoming webinars. We have a really great spring lineup. Our next one is on pre- and post-Civil War slave narratives. That's 7 p.m. on January 29th. Submit your evaluations. And also, if you want to volunteer to vet our new online professional development course, let Karen Koplick know. Uh, again, um, you can get your CEU letters uh, that can be downloaded after you submit those evaluations. Again, let me thank you for your participation, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you'll be back with us again soon. Thank you, and good evening.